I would only like to say in, in, uh, in finishing that I wish Tower Hamlets Council, their representatives, the Member of Parliament, and all those who live in this uh, area, an optimistic future. A future it's based taken on 17 years of fierce battling, but now one of the most famous parts of London's East End is being handed back to the London borough of Tower Hamlets. It's had more than a facelift, there's been a regeneration. And I have no doubt it will succeed because the commitment and desire is absolute. So thank you very much indeed. Just over 20 years ago, the Minister for Aerospace was flying in a helicopter like this over East London. When he looked down, he saw a sight that he found shocking mile after mile of wasteland, poisoned, derelict, abandoned. What had once been the greatest port in the world, the London Docklands, was now apparently a hopeless case. That man, Michael Heseltine, became determined to take on what was at the time the largest urban regeneration in the world. It became an astonishing vision, some said an impossible task, but today the proof of its success is out there for all to see. To me, the challenge was to bring life back to deprived areas, uh, to prove that you could make them attractive, and to, pr and to, and to so uh, create the incentives that people who had discretion where to live, where to send their children to school, where to invest, the people who could make prosperity flow chose voluntarily to come and invest here and live here. So we took a bold decision. We would form an urban development corporation and have it developed together. thriving now, but it wasn't always so. Marketing director Sonny Crouch has seen difficult times as well as good times. This is, this is how we like to welcome our visitors, our nice smiling receptionists, and what we've put up here are some kind of before and afters, so that yes. as soon as you walk into the place, yes. you see that kind of idea of what we're yes. all about. Yes. I think what gives us a great deal of satisfaction myself and all my colleagues in the London Docklands Development Corporation is the sense of having been uh, given the remit of uh, eight and a half square miles of London, very close to the centre, that was derelict, going nowhere, with no future, and leaving it as a place that has improved considerably, particularly physically, and which now has a future and has hope. They called it the London Docklands Development Corporation, and in 1981, when it began, it had to build, almost from scratch, an entire infrastructure, everything needed to create a city within a city. They had an initial annual grant of £70 million, rising to £300 million today. They had the powers to compulsory purchase. They were selected by central government and answerable directly to the Secretary of State for the Environment not so much a democratic body, more a commando force for development. The original conception here in 1981 was of relatively uh, low height developments. Uh, the thought of a canary wharf just didn't enter anybody's mind in 1981. So suddenly you've got a change of focus as the economic strength applied in the middle 80s and the, the new vision for the area developed. Hence the criticisms about transportation into the area which are quite valid and with the benefit of hindsight, but looked ludicrous when the original map of the area was drawn back in uh, 1981. And you have to decide how much economic strength drives uh, a development. They're a close-knit community on the Isle of Dogs. They have a choir and a sense of the long history they're descended from. The Port of London may have served Rome, but it brought prosperity to Britain. 
By the 18th century, the port was enormous. Ships waited days to find a berth. Thieving and smuggling was rife. The solution was docks, walled off from the outside with bonded warehouses and an army of dockers. By Victorian times, the wealth of the British Empire grew. Most of it poured home through the London docks, but the dock communities remained poor. In the Second World War, the Luftwaffe targeted the East End, but couldn't shatter its spirit. At their height, the London docks handled over 60 million tonnes of cargo a year, and 150,000 people worked in or around the docks. But by the 50s and 60s, the docks had become key to the fight between government and trade unions. Jack Dash led them, often out on strike. For common sense to take place in the, in the uh, corridors of power, to get negotiations up for resumption of work based upon the men's demands. The strikes were bitter and in the end futile. The container ship revolution overtook the politics of dispute with a new port further down river and by 1979 Docklands lay derelict and abandoned. Everybody talks about the dockers that lost their jobs, but in, in effect, for every docker's job that lost, there was something like five to ten ancillary workers whose jobs went. So it was, it was a real trauma for, for everybody. In a sense, it was the greatest gift of history to this city, five and a half thousand acres, going all the way from the big estuary right to the heart of the city, literally, you know, to Tower Bridge. Uh, filled with these wonderful big docks, London had been the greatest port in the world. And I could see that you could build here a water city rather like Venice, uh, which would be the most amazing living environment, actually, in London. The docks, you've got to recall, were, were secret places. No one went, went to the docks unless they, they uh, had business there. They were surrounded by high walls, they had their own police force. There was one bus service running in the island in 1981. The roads were awful, and there was no railway, no tube connections. It was a very isolated and pretty poor community. It had many of the benefits that go with uh, those disadvantages. They were very close-knit, loyal, um, a very strong sense of identity, but uh, they also were pretty hard done by. What to do with vast areas of water and land had obsessed committee after committee and produced report after report, filled with argument and indecision. One of the problems that we faced at that time was that the, the government wouldn't give the Doctrine's Joint Committee the powers to, to acquire land off the statutory bodies, like the PLA, like British Waterways, like like British Rail and places like that. You've got to realise that you had got here a monument to failure, uh, to 40 years of failure by local authorities and nationalised industries, a disaster scenario from which life had gone. You had a desert, a wasteland. We were confronted with a, a mesh of overlapping bureaucracies, of the grey men, as I called them in my original speech. We somehow had to find something that would cut through imaginatively and begin selling the idea of enterprise. I saw these 6,000 acres of derelict land. I said, literally, day one, we're going to create urban development corporations and uh, uh, the, the 6,000 acres of uh, East London is going to be the first target. And this was all from a 25-minute helicopter ride over Docklands. If that makes you an expert on Docklands, then the seagulls must be, must be the most expert because they're always flying over Docklands, and they do on Docklands exactly what Astral Time done to us. And why it really does, does give me great personal pleasure, and pleasure, I'm sure, on behalf of all of you here present, uh, to be here opening today this Isle of Dogs Enterprise Zone. We launched 10 Enterprise Zones in 1980-81, and one of them, to my great delight, was here in Docklands. The Docklands' first Enterprise Zone, 93 acres, was the West India Docks, where special tax and planning incentives were offered to tempt private investors but the whole plan was not welcomed by everybody. So we're fighting for this land. This is my roots here. I want this. I want my place here. I don't want it downtown anywhere. I live here. I was born here. I think I'm entitled to live here. 
we saw it as an imposition, we saw it as taking away the democratic rights of the local authorities to drive forward the regeneration process for our people. And we saw it as an imposition coming to do things that we may not necessarily agree with. And uh, we didn't like it. They were the stumbling block. Uh, the London boroughs, the, uh, the GLC as it was then, and the nationalised industries. They were the people who had allowed the rot to permeate as comprehensively and uh, over such a long period of time. They were the problem, and that it was, was it necessary? It was essential to remove them and their powers if we, one was going to get action. I happen to be a three-dimensional guy. I react to places that I'm sort of given responsibility for. And as I walked Docklands, I simply dreamt, you know, you, you had this astonishing area. In fact, despite all its dereliction, all the materials deposited it everywhere. You had these massive docks, you had the riverside, and in the sense you had a location which was unrivaled by anywhere else in the country. I think that Reg Ward was a centurion with vision. Reg had enormous vision and drive. He cared and loved this place and saw its potential. But to some extent, the, the real context was actually generating an entirely different feel about Docklands in the marketplace. So they made a TV commercial to show to Michael Heseltine. Oh, oh, late again. That new town my firm's moved to, 50 miles as the crow flies. And believe me, I have to. Here's another late come up. 150 miles, boy, oh, 150. All business development areas have got one thing in common. They're all not in London. All except the London Docklands. Hmm, I walked here. I didn't get where I am today by being somewhere else. The London Docklands Development Corporation. Why move to the middle of nowhere when you can move to the middle of London? So we did the presentation to Michael, who laughed his head off. Absolutely great, Reg. Terrific. But I can't let you use it. I hadn't told him that we I'd got the space booked for a fortnight at the cost of 600,000 pounds or whatever the figure was. He said, if, if I allow you to do that, I shall have the whole floor of the House of Commons up in arms about sort of your criticism and attack on all the other new towns and so on. I managed to turn around to him and said, but Michael, London is the target for most of the development agencies. All their advertising is directed at robbing London of its people and its firms and so on. So the knocking copy is effectively coming from them, and this is anti-knocking copy. He said, well, I'll give you a chance to persuade me. So we actually got our message across. I came as a temp. Most of the people employed by the corporation were temporary staff in some way or another. Um, and I stayed and never looked back, really. It had huge potential, but it required actually vision, and also it needed real infrastructure and investment in order to make that happen. Uh, one can argue the logic of putting the public works in first, but who was going to put public works into a desert? Selling the land cheaply was a key to getting the place started at all. We went into the worst part of London Docklands, into Beckton. So we said to, to Reg Ward at the time, you must make this land available at low cost, £50,000 an acre, and then we will build low cost houses, which is what we did. In the case of the Barrett Group, it was 164 houses. Now, they were all sold to local people because they were highly affordable. We had the confidence to, to acquire more and more land. We want to build for rent. We want to build for shared ownership. And, and we want to build for the elderly. And we could see that we could create this mixed tenure housing in Docklands with the ability for the development corporation to deliver the land and put in the infrastructure, then, then we knew that we were bound to succeed, and we have succeeded. When the London Docklands Development Corporation commenced in 1981, the number of home, the percentage of homeowners was just 5%. So we're talking about 95% of the area was local authority housing. It was an eight and a half square mile council estate. Very unbalanced, untypical kind of community. What has happened since is something like 25,000 homes have been built, mostly for private ownership, some of them for shared ownership or rent. And what we've ended up with today is 44% home ownership. I spent the first two months walking every square yard of it and so on. 
And everywhere I went, I came across old railway track, which had obviously not been used for 30 or 40 years. So I sort of suddenly started to dream, what if? Why couldn't we actually introduce a new railway system into Docklands? He visited Toronto to check their light railway system and then put his own idea to Michael Heseltine. The skill with Michael was to recognise when his eyes shine and then keep quiet. His eyes started to shine. He said, Reg, I'm coming down again next week. I want you to put me over in a helicopter and trace the route from Fenchurch Street down to the foot of the Isle of Dogs. So I actually produced the plan of the system and I designated where the railway stations would be and I produced three-dimensional images of the development which would sort of be situated around the stations and the type of train that I actually wanted. In fact, you could have had capacity up to 30, 35,000. London Transport and the GLC didn't believe in, in the railway anyway, decided that all Docklands could possibly want would be almost a, a tram. And then I fought like hell with the London Underground and GLC. The railway safety executive said, we have no experience of running the system. So the railway that we actually had, the first Docklands Right Railway, actually had built-in limitations. I've got the press cuttings where the transport correspondents are saying, why have they built such an enormous white elephant of a railway going nowhere to serve nobody? Two years later, the same transport co correspondents saying, why have they built that railway so small? And then, as you know, subsequently, what they spent something like another 400 million in order to achieve what otherwise we would have had first time around. Then Reg Ward had another idea. This one, they told him, was completely potty. And I said, what if we suddenly uh, sort of put a, a small airport, a short takeoff and landing airport? We can use the water to act as an environmental buffer to the communities either side. And overnight, Docklands and, and the Royal Docks would be the launch point uh, towards the whole of Europe and so on. Uh, and people smiled. The key to the idea was the new Dash 7 aircraft, quieter and ideal for short takeoff and landing, ideal too for short haul commuters from the city. At first we thought this was ludicrous. Uh, it has a lot to do with what the place physically looked like at the time. It was quite difficult to envisage airplanes landing on that, on that site. Uh, and you just couldn't see it as an airport. We also saw problems with noise, which still haven't gone away, so we just couldn't see it working. Out! Out of Docklands! Out of Docklands! Out! 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 Much of the opposition um, in the early mid-80s was the fear of the unknown. After all, if, if, if some nice chap turns up in your local community hall and says, don't worry, lads and lasses, it'll be fine, um, we're just going to operate these few aeroplanes into your back garden, almost literally, it would be understandable that people who had not experienced that uh, would be very concerned. When they came back with a second planning application to allow jets to land at the airport, uh, my wife and I and a number of other colleagues from the council decided to come down and join a protest on the uh, weekend when they were flying the jets in uh, on an experimental basis. And we stood outside the airport with our picket lines, our placards, and waiting for these jets to arrive. And they arrived and we didn't hear them. And that's when I thought maybe there's something wrong here. So I went into the terminal building and watched the airplanes landing there, and I still couldn't hear them. People were very sceptical of that in the first place. They said, yes, it'll just be jobs for yuppies. Uh, there'll be lots of people parachuted in from outside, and they'll take all these jobs and, and, and go home at night, and we'll get nothing. That, again, has not turned out to be the case, and, and more than 70% of the 1,000-plus uh, jobs at the airport are filled by people that live, live and have lived all of their lives within five miles of the airport and people now do feel a sense of ownership. On the island itself, it was the most amazing place to be on because there were no, hardly any roads. Everything was just mud. Most people had Wellington boots beside their desks. We had nowhere to eat, no banks, um, no shops. The challenge of all that empty space hadn't gone unspotted by enterprising architects planning permissions almost for the asking, clients that welcomed new ideas. 
I think Cascades looks like a grain silo of some sort. It, it, that big long slope looks incredibly purposeful. It looks very oh, sort of semi-industrial because what's patently true of the river is that the, those buildings look best. The power stations, um, the sort of big engineering feats of Victorian England look fantastic next to this massive river. I think it's certainly made people say, wow, you can do something in Docklands. The LDDC urged them on, and their designs have won more than 90 major awards. Big shapes, big forms, very deterministic forms, if you like, tend to look more pleasing against the river. But local people also spotted an opportunity for a new approach to home building. They wanted to get out of these high-rise uh, flats and deck access estates. So that's when I went to the LEDC and I su suggested that they should enable the local community to develop the housing themselves in a community self-built housing program. And they were pretty skeptical, but they agreed to make a site available, which we'd have to buy at district value as valuation. Each family gave a brief to the architect, and the housing is actually different. It's beautiful housing, and, and actually what is also interesting is, it looks beautiful because its aesthetics come from the need of the architect to design for people and people are different. There was a vision that Docklands can contribute to London as a lung for its expansion and in doing so should be built to the highest quality. Quality in the environment, uh, right down to insisting on granite curbs, sponsoring a program of public works of art, through to the Docklands Light Railway and its new stations, so that the physical environment is of the highest quality, which then feeds the desire for people to be here. It is already established as London's third business district. It's already established as a really attractive part of London to live, because of all the openness and the water and the clean air, it's a really nice bit of London to live in. The events are starting to happen, the amenities, the pubs and the restaurants are here, more opening every day. Business started to move in. Fleet Street arrived virtually lock, stock and barrel. Like the docks themselves, the newspaper industry had been torn by struggles with unions. New technology enabled them to walk away from antiquated machines and exhausting conflict. It was open, it was wide. The London Dockland Development Corporation at the time offered us three sites, and the site behind us is the site that we actually chose. If you ask any of our staff nowadays where would they would prefer to work, they will always say they would prefer to work on the Isle of Dogs. It's a lovely environment. One of the interesting about Docklands was it, it was actually extremely unambitious. The Enterprise Zone was laid out with streets which spelt for sort of industrial sheds, um, and that's what they thought an Enterprise Zone would be. And then J. Ware Travels said, turned up and said, what about Canary Wharf? And they went, oh, I never thought of that. Um, and patently, they thought of a rather suburban kind of development of Docklands. And what's happened to them is a kind of suburban on steroids. But London's square mile, the city, had for centuries dominated the world of finance. It was steeped in history and tradition, resistant to change. Until the mid-1980s, it was heavily regulated and all trading took place on one single market floor. It was about as up-to-date as pounds, shillings and pence. New methods need vast trading floors, super-powerful computers, above all, space. The city lacked that one necessity. It also lacked any affection for the upstarts next door in Docklands. It took an American entrepreneur to spot the doorway to the future. And here was this incredible resource, cheek by jowl with the square mile. You didn't have to be much of a visionary to say, wait a minute, you got a problem here. There's a possible solution sitting there. Why don't we see if we can make it the solution? He'd made millions for the finance empire of first Boston by building a new headquarters in rundown Manhattan. Charged to do the same in London, he ran into city conservatism. He had the clear reputation of being an American 
swashbuckling uh, developer of the sort that perhaps we hadn't traditionally seen in London. He was a one-off, complete one-off. Uh, he was hard driving, um, he was a degree arrogant. I became regarded as the enemy. Then we got active opposition. I was invited back to a board meeting at Creative Suites First Boston in the middle of March. And at the table, well, I didn't know at that time, was where Chapel said he dominated the table because of his size. And so the debate went on for some time as to the project of a backup office. And where suddenly put his hand up and said, but we're asking ourselves the wrong question. The question is, can we move our central office to the Isle of Dogs? And there was an immediate chorus of, no way. I parked up and said, hang on a minute, you couldn't move there unless there was something like a million square feet. By the end of June, it had moved from a million to about two million square feet. End of July, it was up to about five million square feet. I went to Chicago to SOM offices in, in August 1985, and there on the wall was what was originally an 18 million square feet, mini Manhattan on Thames. I'd persuaded the board against all their instincts to allow me to run with it. What I think my colleagues found a little bit alarming was when the challenge went down that we're going to create Wall Street on the water and that we are going to displace the traditional role of the City of London. In other words, whatever Paul Reichman said later, where Travelstead's pitch was definitely, uh, sorry chums, you're finished and we're going to recreate what you should be doing down here. It was a challenge. And so they took a rather sort of patronizing view. But the moment it started to take shape, the view of the city changed, and they really went uh, to, to great extents to defeat and to prevent it actually happening. I don't think they had a clue, because once they got a clue, they did a 180 degree flip and started making all kinds of concessions and sites available in the square mile, the London Wall, and, the, and you can bridge across streets, and oh yes, we know now you need big footprints, and, and they, they did not want Canary Wharf to be draining off any of their tenants. Uh, I think where the competition sharpened to a degree was when um, it was decided on the part of Canary Wharf to start poaching tenants from city buildings, leaving the city buildings empty. We weren't as successful in our poaching early on as we would have liked to have been. I would have thought that most people now in the city recognize that uh, if you hire gunslingers, then you're going to get a few shots fired and the atmosphere is going to hot up. There was incredible pressure put on behind the scenes on every single tenant that we were trying to get to make a move, whether it was Nat West, whether it was Midland Bank. He was a maverick obviously, and a, a dealer, as it were, a dealer in architectural idea and image. Um, he seemed very unlikely. I mean, everyone said, Jay Webb travels what a dodgy guy. You know, he's never going to deliver a multi-billion pound development. How's he going to get the money? Who's going to finance him, etc.? And just Reg Ward's brilliance was just at that moment that where Travis looked completely iffy, he got hold of the Reichman brothers and uh, introduced them to Margaret Thatcher, and the rest, as they say, is history. The sadness was that Ware didn't survive that particular process. Mr. Reichman, ladies and gentlemen, when I learned about this project, it seemed to me one of the most exciting that we had ever known. In the end, yes. unable to put the financial package together, Ware Travelstead sold out to Olympia and York, run by the Reichman brothers. His dream lived on, but it was the Reichmans who built it. Their Canadian company already had an enviable track record for rejuvenating derelict city areas around the world, and they had the money, so they got the nod from the most important lady in Britain. We began this ambitious scheme, and people saw that it could work, saw it with their own eyes. Well, I think one of the great fallacies of the period was that Olympian York uh, took on Canary Wharf or took on London without real thought or real research. I doubt if there was a project better thought through and better research before they actually took it on. It was clear to us uh, in 1987 that for this development to succeed, we had to build a critical mass. We had to build a critical mass of unparalleled quality and we had to obtain a critical mass of tenants of the right quality. 
their vision, their absolute determination to see quality products throughout their operations. The trees were all 20-year-old, 25-year-old trees. The grass was beautifully uh, laid. The fountains work. They don't just flat water around the place. Everything works. So they are beautiful, fine buildings. And also, you have a different approach to the local community, because they're part of your community. And the Reichman brothers are the only major developers who have actually paid any attention to the needs of the local community. The Canary Wharf itself was, in the end, the major influence which actually shaped the final infrastructure of Docklands. And it was only the fact that we were drawing something as large as Canary Wharf that actually forced government to contemplate putting the infrastructure in. It was difficult to get to. Uh, the main road access here uh, is a street called, perfectly correctly, Narrow Street. It was a very narrow street. It was about a mile long. And on the very, as we were getting more and more successful and there was more and more pressure on this road, sometimes it could take you 45 minutes to travel that mile. And that's the crucial mile between Docklands and the city. And of course, that's the mile that Limehouse Link replaced. New roads, the Limehouse Tunnel Link, the Docklands Light Railway extended into the city, and most importantly for Canary Wharf, the Jubilee Line extension, were all firmly planned and partly underway. All you could hear were pile drivers. I mean, the whole buildings used to shake all the time with the noise, particularly at Canary Wharf, when that started going. And it was just great, just really good fun. It wasn't all plain sailing. The first chief executive, the visionary responsible for the achievements so far, ran head-on into the new environment minister, Nicholas Ridley. He didn't always welcome visionaries. You had to seek his views of what he wanted you to do, and we, we offended that on a major scale on his first visit into Docklands. So there was a concern that that the budget was getting bigger than they wanted it to be. And there was also this uh, ancillary concern that, that local people were saying they weren't getting anything about, out of it. And that was supposed to be the point of the thing. So it was at that point that the second chief executive, Michael Honey, was brought in to just bring in a bit of grip and control and to improve relationships with the local authorities and local people. So we started to jointly spend money for the benefit of local people on things that both the local authority and the London Docklands Development Corporation needed to achieve. For instance? For instance, improving local housing. A lot of money's been put into local housing. Putting in health centres. There's 11 new or improved health centres in the area. There are 14 new or improved schools in the area. We support nine vocational centres. <laughs> I'm, I'm declaring it officially... Oh, hang on, I've got to get... Theresa Joanne. Right, Theresa Joanne officially open. I bet this misses. The whole refit of the barge has been financed by the London Docklands Development Corporation. Um, we, as a club, have to do the final fit-out. They've helped us with the, the use of the water, because water is such a premium now, um, and Docklands is, is up and coming. Um, and we have now a 50-year lease here in Docklands, so the sport has actually got a fixed base. And, of course, the LDDC being involved in this project clearly indicates that they see that leisure facilities in this area are very, very important, not just for the local community, but for the whole of the East End. We felt that it could be a living water park, you know, graced by the movement of boats and sails, and much more exciting and interesting. And we went to the Sports Council and got a bit of funding, and we actually wrote a strategy for the use of the water space in Docklands as an amateur body of committed water sports enthusiasts. And we did a lot of lobbying, and eventually we got the minister to accept it, and the LDDC then took it on board, and it appointed one of our members as their first water development officer. 
a whole catalogue of water sports have found a home. The great water resource is being used. In the Royal Albert, youngsters learn basic seamanship, and in the Millwall, life is more energetic. <laughs> the market-driven economy of the late 80s boomed. It was a time of mobile phones and telephone number salaries. Buy was the buzzword, buy now. People were just desperate to buy the best flats. They queued up and then they were buying flats like you buy um, a washing machine. They were buying them at the time and they would do deals there and then, bang, done. And so over that weekend they sold hundreds of flats in this scheme. Um, on Monday, um, the Monday of that weekend was Black Monday. Black Monday wrote billions off the stock market in a few hours. The new buzzword for Docklands particularly was negative equity. Tough times, but not all gloom and doom. You know, the feeling within the LDC was simply we just had to tough it out with a smile on our face. After 1988, the only people who had many money left to spend on housing sites were the housing associations with government money to build public sector housing. So actually the market itself delivered a huge chunk of housing to rent in that period between 88 and 93. But global recession and rising costs added to local community opposition threatened the future of the agency. I was almost brought in to stop it being wound up prematurely because uh, in 1990, relations between the corporation and its, uh, and its government patron, the, the Department of the Environment, got, were, got very rough indeed. There were two fundamental reasons, uh, the spiraling costs of the Limehouse Link and other major infrastructure projects. Not only were the costs rising, but they weren't being reported in sufficient time to the department. So the department felt that it, it, it had lost control here. At the same time, we were working on encouraging the Jubilee Line to uh, come here, uh, working on the Lewisham extension to the Docklands Light Railway, and continuing with the completion of the Docklands Highway Network, so that all the infrastructure would be in place for the resurgent Docklands after the, uh, the recession came to an end. The then minister responsible, Michael Portillo, lost his patience with the corporation, and there was a, a bit of a crisis. He rejected the corporate plan, an absolutely unheard of uh, uh, event, and there was a, a general uh, clear out, some voluntary, some involuntary, of uh, senior management. And on the day that the then chief executive left, I was uh, seconded to the corporation to try to put things back on, a, on an even keel. Only Olympia and York seemed safe, but insiders knew that the cost of Canary Wharf was sucking the parent company dry. When we came in in 1987, there was a firm promise to deliver the Limehouse Link before we opened our project, and there was a firm promise to deliver the Docklands Railway into Bank Station by the time we opened our project. And indeed, we made a very significant financial contribution to the Docklands Railway. Unfortunately, there were delays on both programs, and that undoubtedly hurt us in the early years. The government's firm commitment to this project has been shown in particular by our commitment to put in the necessary transport links so that the thousands of people who will be working at Canary Wharf can make their journeys in comfort and reliability. I'm delighted to participate in today's ceremony. And we're all very short together. Olympia and York had agreed to pay hundreds of millions towards the cost of the Jubilee Line extension, but when the time came for the first instalment, the firm was already in financial trouble. Plans to start building were halted, and without it, Olympia and York couldn't survive. When I joined Paul in 1987, bank lending was at about 15 billion to the property sector. And I thought, I think many thought, that it would top out, it would peak at around 20 to 22 billion. And that itself would be the constraint on supply. In fact, it topped out in 1991 at about 42 billion. And it was that flood of money which fueled perhaps excessive development, not just in London, not just in commercial, but in all sectors across the UK. And when the recession came, 
there was massive asset deflation in each of their core business areas. Olympia and York crashed. Paul Reichman lost control. The Docklands flagship was taken over by the banks. It looked likely to sink. It still all depended on the Jubilee line. The big battle was fought in uh, 1992. When I first came here as chairman, uh, as the election was called five days after I arrived. Canary Wharf went uh, into administration about six weeks later. And what the administration Canary Wharf meant was a challenge and a threat to whether the Jubilee Line ever be built. No government would ever build that railway line without certainty that the economic and, and physical development uh, which it, for which it was so important was actually going to occur. So our argument had to uh, focus on the fact that without it, a whole chunk of London would go for a lifetime, uh, or many lifetimes probably ahead, uh, with no chance of being developed. Uh, the Treasury ministers were very hostile to it, and certain other spending ministers at a time when the government was acutely squeezed for finance. And then finally, of course, the administrators had to find their share of the money at a time when uh, the banks, uh, all many of them, I forget how many there were, but there were just dozens of them, they were arguing amongst themselves as to whether to support the administration. It needed both the government to recommit to the project and to Canary Wharf bankers, who were in charge at that time, to reconfirm their private sector contribution to the line, which the government had set at £400 million. And in fact, it was the European Investment Bank who, in the end, proved to be the salvation. And I very much hope that, uh, that they see all their money and their return come back, because they were the courageous investors who, in the end, uh, swung, the, swung the day. When I first got to Canary Wharf, um, I spent the first two or three months looking around and said to myself, well, what's wrong with this project? And I came to the conclusion there was nothing wrong with it, but nobody believed that. Um, the, the main problem was everybody you spoke to said, but you can't get there. Well, by that time, the railway was running properly. The road had been opened, and you could get there. And so we had to involve ourselves in a real hearts and minds exercise to persuade the wider world, if you like, that um, it wasn't on the far side of the moon anymore. So they used a trick. I'd invite them for lunch. And the fascinating thing was that without exception, every single one turned up between 20 minutes and to half an hour early because they would have been told by their secretaries, oh, you're going to Canary Wharf for lunch, you'd better leave just after breakfast. And of course, when they came, they found that um, the transport was fine. It didn't really take that long to get there. And then when they started looking around the place, they'd look at it, because none of them had seen it before, and said, but this is absolutely amazing. We've never seen anything like it. With its hard-won infrastructure in place and the Jubilee line under construction, Docklands looked secure. One Canada Square, nicknamed the Vertical Fleet Street, was almost full as the recession ebbed away. Paul Reichman was back. The city now recognised Canary Wharf as a partner rather than a rival. The future looked good. It was about 7 o'clock, smack on 7 o'clock, and this almighty bang just went up and we were in one of the side streets and just saw chaos, all alarms going off, windows smashing. The news agents who were killed were, that's our nearest news agent. We went to buy our birthday cards in there, people who smoked got their fags in there, we went to buy the newspapers in there. These guys weren't fighting a war. I think it, it, it set off from me a sense of determination uh, to see that we would absolutely recover and be twice as successful as uh, before. In one blast, one million square feet of office space was destroyed. This bomb went off at one minute past seven Friday night. By Monday morning, working over the weekend, calling in the agents and the business people, key holders we could get in contact with, we had something like 60% of the businesses relocated by Monday morning and 100% two days later. The Germans didn't bomb us out of existence and the IRA ain't going to either. Soon, the local boroughs have to take this mega-rich development over. 
Tower Hamlets is one of the poorest in the country. What does it fear and what does it need for the future? To encourage these new employers to understand that they can't just come into the East End and live in these gleaming buildings and take no recognition of the community they're part of. Because I think if they do that, ultimately, they will have to have a private police force and high barbed wire. They must look locally. They must look at the talent and ability that's here in this community. One of the things I've been pleased with is that we've recently, in partnership with Tower Hamlets, set up a centre. We call it Skills Match. That's the true cement between the community and this development, its jobs, its identity, it's people feeling good about it because they feel good about themselves. I think that Canary Wharf is somewhere that they don't come to enough, but now that we're here and we're pulling local people to come here, I think it's encouraged them to think that it is within their remit to get jobs here, really. We just recently got um, three people into Mark Pier Wyatt, the restaurant at the top. We've just filled some vacancies in the sports shop. We've had lots of different vacancies from companies within Canary Wharf itself. So we're very pleased with the response and we're pleased, obviously, that we're getting local people the chance to get into these jobs. They have reorganised themselves. They have um, embraced our approach and philosophy and vision almost uh, completely, in, in, in fact, in some respects, you know, they're more Catholic than the Pope. And what we have done with the boroughs is to offer them offsets to their revenue expenditure, either in the form of assets, for instance, the freehold of the shopping centre in Surrey Keys to, to Southwark, assets which they can either sell or which produce revenue. We'd also be arguing, as you would expect, that central government uh, really should complete its investment so much has already been spent in the Docklands. It would be a shame uh, to not see that job complete and the momentum sustained. One final area has to be completed, the Royal Docks, a third of the entire Docklands. As the LDDC prepares to leave, the final agreements are in place for a giant development. What they started, others will finish, but it will finish. There is already uh, uh, the first phase of an urban village of a thousand homes under construction. Uh, 700 of those for uh, private development by Wimpies and uh, 300 being developed by two housing associations. Norton Pharmaceuticals uh, are committed to build their European headquarters in the business park and uh, the East London University Docklands campus is about to start work. So that there are very major building blocks in place. I'm delighted that we have at last signed the exhibition centre deal. It is the most important development for uh, Docklands um, uh, since uh, the recession. London needs uh, a new exhibition centre of this sort of calibre. There really is nowhere else in London. And in all of London, there's no location better suited with, you know, with the waterside location, with the transport links that are already there, and the ones that are to come with the CTRL going to be in Stratford, uh, as well as the Jubilee Line extension that is coming this area. So we're encouraging local employers to get involved with young people in schools, to make our young people feel that Docklands belongs to them, that if they want to get a job there and they work hard enough, that's a real possibility. This to us is a good agency to continue the works begun by the LDDC. We want to make sure those uh, disposals and assets that are realized now are actually reinvested in the area rather than perhaps taken and spent somewhere else in the country. Tony Blair thought that it was the, the part of New Labour Britain to which to introduce the French Prime Minister and President. That's a pretty good tribute. Uh, if this horror of private enterprise created in the worst years of Thatcherism is the best exhibit that Tony Blair can present to the French Prime Minister and, and President. It's all there, a living monument, Docklands, a new city, a new business district, new and rebuilt communities. There were mistakes, there were struggles, but in the end, they achieved that vision and won what they wanted. I suppose what we did, against all rationality, against all market and planning criteria, was actually to bring Docklands into the mainstream of London life. I don't think there's anything else like it anywhere. I've always had this itch to kind of 
cause things to happen. I knew it would work. It was simply a matter of keeping one's nerve. I think that the, the timetable was about right. We've, uh, we've, we've, we've done our job. It's up to them now. It's thriving. It's, the joint is jumping in every kind, kind of way. I have a particular pleasure in the fact that my son and his new wife have a house down here now. I just think it's going to settle down as really one of the nicest parts of London for you to live, work or visit. And that's how it should be. It's been the most enjoyable, pleasurable and involved task that I've held in my business uh, career. And to see it subsequently come to fruition as it has has been uh, a source of immense pleasure. Thank you.